Judy Rhodes, and the subject is Heise Etching. Okay. Ms. Rhodes, the floor okay. is yours. Okay, I have a handout here. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not an informational handout, it's just a, an illustrative thing in case we didn't have enough examples here. I, I put some on here. Uh, so if you take one for each family, or if you're if you're not a part of a family, you can have a whole one just to yourself. <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> Aren't we special? Aren't you special? <laughs> you share yours and let you my share family. family. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Folk can share down that one. <laughs> there are a couple of extras, I think. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll, uh, I'll share. You can share mine. I can share Charlene's and you can have that one here. Or I can share yours. <laughs> um, the way I'm going to incorporate the pieces that you have brought is that uh, this is divided into sections as to the, the style of etching that I'm going to be discussing. And at the end of each of those sections, then we'll go around and discuss. Uh, for instance, we'll start with needle etching. So at the end of that discussion, then we'll go around and, and share what we have in, in terms of needle etchings and so forth through the program. Uh, for this um, program, I used mainly the Breda Hoff book on etchings and carvings, kind of the Bible. It has good narrative in it with good detail. And I also uh, used um, Walter's recent uh, article in the Heise News. I and thought that was last timely. <laughs> yeah, last <laughs> December. That was yeah. really well done, too. Yeah, yeah, but he took that mostly from <laughs> every <laughs> off anyway. <laughs> so, and then I uh, scoured the internet and got some articles on glass etching in general that I used. And uh, also, the Cambridge Crystal Ball has archived a lot of articles, and one of some of the most interesting ones were back in the early 90s, the the local uh, study club in Cambridge, Ohio, um, <coughs> brought in people who had oh, former factory workers mm. and interviewed them at their <coughs> meetings, brought them into a meeting. And they would talk about what they had done. They took pictures, they videotaped some of them, and then they wrote an article for the Crystal Ball about it. And most of those at that point in time were women who had worked in the etching department. So there were about five or six of those where they talked about little details. So I got a lot of little juicy stuff Ooh, from those yeah. articles also. So those, that, that consists of my footnotes right there. Um, from 1914 until the Heise factory's closing in 1957, there was always some kind of etching process being used to enhance the beauty of Heise glassware. The earliest and simplest technique used was needle etching. Most needle etching was done between 1914 and 1928. Kind of remember these dates because my initial re uh, reaction when I heard about the etchings was, okay, so they did needle etchings for a while, and then they stopped doing those, and then they did pantograph for a while, and then they stopped doing that, and they did plate etchings for a while. And that's not true. They all overlapped. They all were done at very at uh, different times, but overlapping times. With this method, the entire piece of glass was covered with melted beeswax or paraffin or resin. And this example shows this is, has an etching on it, but you can see the beeswax that covered the entire piece. When the wax was cooled, the piece was put into a revolving clamp while mechanically operated steel needles traced a design on the glass, removing the wax coating. One or multiple pieces, mostly stemware, could be etched at one time. This is difficult to picture because we don't have any pictures of the needle etching. We have the stuff about the pantograph etching, but not about the needle etching as such. So I think we all have in our heads some, <laughs> some kind of image of, these, of this needle moving and the, and the pieces revolving and that kind of thing, but, but we don't really know how what it looked like. After the design had been cut through the wax, the piece was immersed in an acid bath for about 10 minutes. Now, most of these uh, etching processes, this te I'll be telling you how strong the acid was, how long they kept it in. For the needle etching, we have no idea. 10 what minutes that was. is a long time. Depends on the strength of the, of the acid. Right. Yeah. yeah. The acid ate away the glass where the wax had been removed. The piece was then immersed in hot water 
to remove the wax and the wax dropped to the bottom of the hot water tank and was siphoned off and reused. Mm. Heise needle etches were numbered from 1 to 52 and there were about 20 different etches. They were continuous geometric designs with groups of simple lines, zigzags, loops, and curves. Since the same needle etching machines were sold to all the glass companies, they all tended to produce the same or similar designs. Therefore, unless you can positively identify that a piece of glass was on a Heise blank, it's difficult to tell if it was Heise or not. The next etching process was the pantograph etching. It started in 1919 and continued until 1930. You can see that overlaps with the 1914 to 1957 a little bit there. Heise also produced pantograph etching. This technique is similar to needle etching, but more complicated and more expensive. Pantograph etchings were numbered between 100 and 200, and there were about 20 of them. Designs were more elaborate, but were still basically geometric in shape, or a limited to outline type design. Uh, you can see some examples of pantograph etching on the uh, bottom of the first page of your handout there. And the thing that I think was neat about that is Monticello on the left and Salem on the right are the same basic etching. And what they did was uh, the border of, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. just leave the border off on the yeah. Salem one mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. made a whole whole new uh, etching pattern that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. With a pantograph a design, and you'll see a picture of a pantograph machine on page two, and uh, gives you a little bit big, better idea of uh, how that looked. The etching design is etched oversized onto a large steel plate. You can see that there it's kind of a chevron patriotic looking design. A worker, worker traces the design with a stylus covering the entire outline and each movement is followed by a small needle pressing against a wax covered piece of glass <laughs> revolving on a clamped platform. Depending on the size of the machine, one or several dozen pieces can be prepared at one time. After, de after the design is scratched into the wax, the pieces are immersed in an acid bath producing the etching. The rest of the process is the same as with needle etching. Okay, on the plate etchings. Okay. By far the most successful kind of acid decoration, decoration, plate etching, was done extensively for many years, from 1916 to the factory's closing in 1957. So, you know, part of the time while they were doing needle etching and pantograph etching, they were also starting to do plate etchings. There were approximately 80 different plate etchings produced, and their numbers were from 300 to the low 500. And I have an etching plate here. It's for Heise Rose, which our examples are from also. And this is a plate that is uh, for uh, the center of a 10 half inch service plate, which is the only plate we could find in the book that, yeah, the, that was that was a plate. There were some salad plates, but there wasn't like a dinner plate. There was just this big service plate. And you can see, well, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself here. And because it says that you can see it written down here when I'm going to pass this around so you can see it says this is a four and a half inch in diameter uh, design and this is a five inch one but they're both for the ten and a half inch plate hmm. who knows Interesting. yeah and you can see there's did a dotted them, did they make them on one pattern only they didn't not rows What I'm oh, saying yeah, is what shape, you, yes, the shape may differ, and because the shape is different, it requires a different size. Oh rose yeah, I'm sure they had. The I'm sure right. they had different right. yes, plates with almost. different yeah. edges. Well, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I, I'll get to yeah. that. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I noticed to, just today, looking at it, there's a dotted line around here, around both of them. Looks like you know the kind of line that would direct you where to cut or something, and. I, we assumed that that meant that that was indeed where they would cut it and that that would help center it, you know, when they got ready to place it on the plate, that, that, that those, right. Right. those lines would help center it. And then, just now as we, I was sitting here, on this one I discovered 
at the top edge, you'll see it when I pass around, there's a dotted line. Mm. So the dotted oh, line on this yeah. helped them, they knew to put that right on the edge of the piece, mm -hmm. uh, on the edge of the goblet. And that helped them get, get it centered. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. A designer's drawing was put onto a metal plate photographically and then etched to develop the design in relief. The design was raised and the surrounding area was etched away to a lower level. This part that is shiny er, and lighter is the lower level. This, this is the raised part, this, light, this darker part. And the surrounding area was etched away to the, the lower level. Plates with different sizes of the etching accommodated many different blanks, from a tight, tiny cordial to a large platter. I know I've seen the etching plate for uh, orchid. Yeah. You know, and, and there's just all kinds of pieces, like for uh, uh, salad plates, and for different kinds of things. Well, and then and not every piece gone. could accommodate the entire design. Either. Exactly, and they, they would... Adjust alter it, yeah. right. right? Alter, ma make fewer branches of, of uh, say, on rose or, or some of the others. Um, okay, I, I guess I'm going. I can pass this around now, and then we can talk about it later. But I'm I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself again. But you can feel it, look at it. It's heavier than you think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. it is. Okay. Okay. In the etching process, okay, here's where it gets complicated. A <laughs> printmaker spread a coat of black acid resistance ink, resistant ink, onto the etching plate, so that they would take, like a brayer, mm -hmm. or, uh, or just a knife, and spread it across and work it in, so that it worked down into the the lower level of the etching, and then scrape it off so that the top part, the design itself, was clean and the and the acid or the acid resistant wax was filling had filled in the lower areas. The design was let's see in the etching in Cambridge documents this ink was referred to as an etching ground and I I'll refer to it as that for a while. It consists of beeswax wax lamp black, resin, and turpentine. And this was cooked at least overnight before mm -hmm. being used. And the etching plate was kept warm and the etching ground in a pot was kept warm. And the printmaker used a knife or brayer working the etching ground well into the recessed areas on the etching plate. Then scraped the surface clean so that the surface had no etching ground on it. A p piece of tissue paper and the people from Ca from Cambridge believed that the company bought the paper, the tissue paper, from England. It was some special kind of paper that they used. It was placed on the plate and then gently rubbed with a piece of felt. So now you got the, all this etching ink down in the grooves. Got a piece of paper over it, and they would take a piece of felt and rub over that. And they, you know, obviously they had to know just how hard and how long to transfer to, to, the, to get that to in order for the, the ground to transfer onto the paper and stick onto the paper. To the piece of paper. So yeah. that when they pulled the paper off, it was on the paper. Hmm, where are we? I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I wanted to tell you beforehand, there is right here a little bitty piece of the tissue paper hmm. stuck oh, yeah, and it's see. still on there oh, yeah. that didn't quite come off. Hmm. I'm not about to take it off. No. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a little ahead of my story hmm. too, but I want you to notice that when I pass it around. The paper carefully removed from the plate was then given to one of a series of girls working in the shop, quote unquote. Mm. And the shop was a group of people who worked together to complete the process. There may have been multiple shops, perhaps as many as eight working in the factory at any one time. 
After the printer handed the tissue to the first girl, and she was called the cutout girl, she inspected to make sure that the print had all transferred completely onto the tissue paper. Now, keep in mind, this had to be staying warm because it had to be warm to transfer to the glass. So she was working pretty quickly with this once it, you know, the, the, the uh, printmaker would pass it to her and she would pass it on and I'm going to pass this around now. This is a, a photo of the, of the actual factory. And here you can see the guy, the printmaker, working and then this girl with the back to it is the cutout girl. Hmm. And then these other girls over here did the other tasks that I'm going to describe. Judy, would there be a, a different plate for each each type of glass or each shape of glass? Sometimes it would be one great big plate that would have several different. Uh, because I can see something transferring to this would be different than something transferring to that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Goblets would be yeah. the most difficult. Yeah. 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 And they would they were like because curved. Of size. Because of the different shape and size. And if you noticed on the plate, it says what it's for. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, and you can see on that on the plate around the edge it says because it says that that's for the ten and a half inch plate, and it was a Waverly plate by the way what that was on. Cut out girl. She inspected to make sure the print was complete. She then cut out the pattern and handed it to one of two girls called the put on girls. <laughs> now you can see with this dotted line thing that that acted as a guide to the put on girls to exactly where to place it on the piece. Mm -hmm. Who carefully placed the tissue on the glass blank. Then these two girls handed the pieces to the next two girls who were called rub down girls. <laughs> And they had the hardest job. Theirs was to rub the tissue with a piece of felt or an eraser-like tool. This had to be done while the etching ground was still warm and the worker had to know just how much pressure to apply to get that stuff on the, on the uh, piece. Finally, the piece was dipped into an alcohol water mixture to loosen the tissue paper and leave the print remaining on the glass. Mm -hmm. Like I said, here's the little piece of tissue paper still on. Now I'm going to pass this around. This has, over time, some of it has, like has deteriorated, but you can still see the uh, wax oh, in, the, in the print. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, no, try not to touch the black. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry, I should have handed right that to you in an uh, easier way. Looks like compost. At this point, yeah, after those that piece, of the, after the uh, tissue paper had been washed off with the alcohol, the glass pieces were loaded onto a cart and transferred to the department that was variously referred to as the wax department, the hot wax department, or the paint department. Here the girls worked at tin covered tables with tubs of warm etching ground or just plain beeswax. Yeah. Now I have seen these kinds of examples of Cambridge glass also. And this place part here where Heise used just beeswax, at least on this one, uh, on Cambridge, they used the etching ground to cover it because the, the whole piece would be would be entirely black on, on Cambridge pieces. So I don't know whether they just, that that was something that was consistent in that in each factory all the time or whether they switched to beeswax because it was cheaper later on because Rose was a later right. etching. I don't know what, but you can see it uh, covering everything, including the inside. Because anywhere mm -hmm. the wax is, the acid would not. Right. Get on the glass. Right, right. The and so right. it had to. The beeswax right. had to cover the yeah. edge the of the yeah. of the black part. Mm -hmm. Right. As well as inside and on the bottom and everything else. But not inside the black part where the design. Was where the exposed. design okay. exactly. Right. Exactly. Uh, tin covered tables with tubs of warm etching ground or just plain beeswax. Amazing. The temperature of the etching ground or wax could be regulated. If they had larger items, the wax was cooler and thicker. If they had small items like cordials or something like that, the uh, wax was uh, warmer and thinner. The girls were provided with a one-inch paintbrush. 
If a complicated etching required different sizes of brush, the girls had to provide their own. <laughs> <laughs> so if they wanted a different size, but you know, one inch brush, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> After the entire piece was covered, covered, leaving only the area to be eaten away by the acid exposed, the pieces were handled one more time by a touch-up girl. And she looked at it to make sure that every area was, was completely covered. Then she was the final one. That's amazing. Then the pieces were suspended on racks and taken to the etching tanks. Each shop could put out 10 to 15 dozen pieces an hour. Wow. And the work was wow. Dozen yeah. pieces. 10 wow. to 15, yeah. Okay. But see, there were two of each of those stations. Yeah. Right. right. That's, that's more, that yeah. seems like more than you That's a lot imagine. of work. Yeah. And it could be that, you know, maybe the, this was one of the things that was reported by one of the Cambridge workers. So it could be that, you know, she worked on an easier etching or right. a smaller, we'll you know, that. something like that. Yeah. And uh, maybe, maybe that's a high figure and not an average. And the workers were paid by the piece. So cooperation within each shop was to everyone's advantage. Ew. And they would mark on the bottom of each piece, on the bottom of the foot. They had a mark for each shop so that they would know as they were going in. They could keep count of how many each shop was, had put in when it went to the, uh, to the etching uh, station. The acid tanks, and here we get very specific about the, the uh, hydrofluoric acid. The acid tanks were filled with one part of a 60% solution of hydrofluoric acid and two and a half to three parts of water. The pieces to be etched were immersed for 15 to 20 minutes. After the acid bath, the pieces were immersed into a tank of scalding hot water, same as before, where the etching ground was melted off, in the off the glass and reclaimed for future use. The final step before packing was a hand polish with sawdust. When the factory closed in 1957, there were three etchings still in production. Plantation, Ivy, Orchid, and High Z Rose. Okay, I think that's all the examples of that. Okay, next we're going to talk about the double plate etchings, which are just an offshoot of the, of the plate etchings. Uh, they were also called cameo etchings. They're so named because two etching plates and two processes were involved. These are sometimes referred to as cameo etchings, and there were about 14 double plate patterns. Mm -hmm. Some of the earliest, and they were made from 1918 to 1956. And uh, some of the earliest ones uh, weren't like the cameo etchings that we think of with, a, with either a chevron or, a, or a, an oval with a plate. They were, you can see on your handout. Um, the left hand one yep, is cherry. is uh, is is called cherries, and it, it was you know it, the 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 center of the cherries right. was uh, was etched first, and then yeah, the, the rest of the uh, etching was put around it. But we'll go into that in a minute. But that that was a little bit different. And the the cameo etchings were more popular than the than the fruit and and. Uh, uh, flowers etchings. They were only made for just a few years, uh, from 1919 to 1924, and then all the double plate etchings from that point on were all the cameo etchings. Process is the same as for plate etchings with a few additions. First, the background of the cameo or medallion was lightly etched using the same process as for plate etchings. So they would take the piece and they would only, yeah, she's got, she's got one and I've got one here. Uh, just the circle and then that one, the oval, was etched. Everything else was covered up. Really just neat. that, just the, just the circle itself, nothing in it at that point. And then oh, it was sent through again and the design was put on, the, the rest of the design. The background of the cameo is lightly etched using the same process of plate etching. Then another pattern, usually containing an ornate frame for the cameo, suspended from a band and connected to other cameos with swags of light chain, is centered over the frosted area. Usually a decorated figure, an animal or a person, or flowers was placed over the center of the frosted cameo. 
The acid then etched the frame and chain and etched even deeper the figure placed over the center. When we pass so these around... A double dose. Mm -hmm. That's why it was called double plate. Yeah, but if you run your finger, you can see that this figure that's inside the cameo is deeper than the cameo itself. Mm. Well, yeah, I can learn to appreciate many of that better. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just... You do or don't? Well, I, I don't, didn't. Mm. <laughs> one menu was, was one of those. But I do. Usually a decorated figure, an animal or person or flowers was placed over the center of the frosted cameo. The acid then etched the frame and chain and etched even deeper the figure placed over the already etched cameo. These etchings were delicate and enchanting and very popular. I want to hand me those two plates also. This one that's coming around right now is... Which one is that? I don't know. Oh, that's Pied Piper. Yes, that's yeah. Pied Piper. Yeah. And it has a dancing girl in two poses and one piper in the, in the various... Uh, pieces around it. I didn't know that either. Mm -hmm. I thought they were all the same. Mm -hmm. That's why I was noticing they were different. No, they'll be different. Mm -hmm. Judy was getting ready to say it. No, the menu yeah, they are different. They are different. Okay, too. this one is called Renaissance and this, this one is interesting because on this one, you can see it when it comes around, they, they miss their aim and the, and the <laughs> the background is here and the, and the frame is off center mm -hmm. and if you can figure out what the, sti uh, the figure is in it and most of the others it tells it says a stag or a dog or a, a, you know, a piper or a horseman or whatever it is and what the figure is. In Renaissance it just says the motif. Well this is on the top <laughs> of the plate. All the rest of them are underneath. They're not on the actual surface of the Not all. No. Mm -mm. Most of this is surface. No, those are on the surface. These are all on the surface. I know, but the ones that have come around weren't no. on the used side of the, oh, of the, uh, the item. Oh, okay, those are mm -hmm. the single plate etches. Right. But the double plates are on the, on yeah. the top. Yeah. Right. Okay, so this is, a, you, I can't, I, if you can figure out what the, what the little figure is inside, uh, more power to you. I'm not sure, but this, this one is called Renaissance. And you can see this, it's, it's very ornate around the edge. And then this one is. And I have um, etched plates, but they're etched. Uh, they're etched on this side, mm -hmm. not this mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. Depends on the kind of etch it is. Yeah. 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 And this one is is Diana, and Diana has um, five different cameos: a stag, two poses of dogs, and two poses of Diana. And this one has one piece of Diana, one stag, and one pose of a dog, because it's a smaller piece and it only has three cameos. Oh, the glare of the light. Oh. There's also a picture yeah, that I'm going to be passing around that has uh, just rows of carts with pieces on, and I can't tell, maybe you can, whether the peaches are pieces are already etched, whether they're in the, on their way to be etched, or whether they're just blanks waiting to go in to have something done to them. Mm. What's it say on the back? It just says who <laughs> it was donated oh. by, and I'll get to that later. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think so. Because there's a story to that. Maybe a house. Okay. We're almost Not there. Really. <laughs> the next uh, etching process uh, is called the deep plate or the silhouette etching or the deep plate etching. These etchings were made by a slightly different <laughs> process from plate etchings. Ronald Wool's head of the etching department applied for a patent for this process in 1933 and it was used as a glass decoration until 1952. Over the years approximately 25 etchings were developed that proved to be very popular. Their numbers ran from the mid 400s to the early 500s. Mm. And this Ronald Wools, as a matter of fact if you look on the back of these pictures it says photo donated by Grace Wools, former employee. Mm. And it's spelled W O O L E S, like the, you know the same way. So it it was some relative, either his wife or his sister or his sister-in-law or somebody, mm -hmm. hmm. who also worked at the factory along with this Ronald Wools, who was the head of the etching department. Okay, as you've seen in ordinary plate etchings, the design consisted of thin lines. In silhouette etchings, the designs were silhouettes or solid block figures where the whole design was exposed to the acid and etched out. 
After the areas not to be etched were covered by it, this acid resist, the piece was dipped into a mixture, and listen to this, one part 80% hydrofluoric acid and two parts water for 45 to 60 minutes. Wow. Wow. A lot stronger, too. This produced a silhouette design that was uneven in appearance, being more deeply etched in some areas than in others. This was due to the large areas to be etched, the use of a strong acid solution, and the long period of time in the acid. The acid formed insoluble salts that deposited in different areas of the exposed glass, and where those salts gathered, it didn't etch as deeply as it did in other spots, and that's how it, it got that uneven appearance. And rather than see that as a fault with the process, they thought that that kind of added a little bit of depth to the to the uh, to the etching and and, and was uh, made it different. And uh, they considered it a pleasing effect. Now, now we get to talk about Arctic etch. Mm -hmm. Arctic etch is listed in the book as a plate etching. Mm -hmm. Jim. But if you can, uh, as we look at it when it comes around, it looks like a silhouette etching because it indeed is acid in large areas. Okay. Remember the, the years I said. Patent uh, was applied for in 1933. Yeah. The years for the production of Arctic Edge were 1932 to 1937. Mm -hmm. So they think that that was when they started fooling around with the idea yeah. of a silhouette edge, silhouette edge. with, with, uh, with <coughs> Arctic Edge. Oh, that is, look at that. that, that is, yeah, that, I, that's that just is a spectacular. It really it is. It really is. Here's a piece of tally ho on a, on a beer uh, mug that is the same silhouette etching. You can feel the depth of it and understand how that strong a solution would really etch really deeply is. into it. It really is. And. Well, and I'm sending say around a mermaid piece, feel. also that is no, uh, silhouette etching. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to talk a little bit about matte etchings. In this process, the surface to be frosted was subject subjected to a weak acid bath for a short period of time to produce a uniform light matte finish. By using the acid resist coating on various parts of the piece, areas could remain unfrosted, producing a pleasing pattern. This process was used from 1935 to 1942. Carvings, while not involving acid etching, still involve a technique that alters the appearance of the surface wow. of the glass to produce a decoration. About 14 etchings were created by Heise using the sandblast method. They were first produced in 1934, and the technique was used until 1942. Their numbers, numbers are in the low 5,000s. There was some correspondence between T. Clarence Heisey and Robert Irwin, the sales manager, in 1933. And T. Clarence was really hot on this, on the, car, the carvings. He thought that, that was a great idea. And he talked about, in this letter, he talked about plans to purchase equipment from the reliable sandblasting company. And they were going to buy a machine to, produce, to do this work for $100. <laughs> <laughs> and he states that a large Ingersoll Rand compressor that the factory already owned would be adequate to use in the process because they need something to, you know, to, to blast the, mm -hmm. the sand. Right. He also referred to the advice of a French colleague that said, who said, as soon as America discovered sandblasting, it would be the vogue, and I think we ought to hop to it. <laughs> so, T. Clarence was the marketer of the family, I yeah. think. <laughs> he was the innovator. Yeah. This sandblasting method was similar to that used for carving tombstones. First, a drawing or stencil was made, then a rubbery coating. Now, they didn't go to, to any, in any detail about this, but it was a, because, you know, the, the old stuff that they used with the wax and everything, you know, the sand would just eat that away. Eat that, you know, blow that away in, in no time at all. So it was a rubbery coating which could resist the sand, and it was applied to the glass, and the coating was carved away, exposing the pattern. I don't, that seems like pretty or intense. Like out yeah, too. that seems pretty labor-intensive, too, because they'd have to work on each piece one at a time well. to carve that out. Uh, the coating was carved away, exposing the pattern 
which was then subjected to the sandblasting. The depth of the carving could be varied by the operator. So that's why you see some pieces that, that look a little bit more opaque than others because it was maybe carved a little bit deeper. Uh, after part of the carving had been done, more of the rubbery coating could be cut away so that the design could be changed or shaded by further blasting, you know, to, to uh, add some depth to it. Uh, to it. Um, I have Nimrod here, and this one's pretty deep. It's neat. You can you can feel the the etching. This this, this is one of the carvings. Nice. Most of them had a very Art Deco-y appearance. They were very stylized. I think they were neat. And let's see. What? Well, Judy, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Great program. Thank you.